All right. Um, so I guess, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, my name is Mary Grace Calme, or MG, so I go, go by for short. And today's seminar is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be presenting Loft Orbital, because I am, I'm not a student or a researcher at Virginia Tech. Uh, I actually work at Loft Orbital Solutions, which is a new space startup in San Francisco. And so today I'll be talking a little bit about what we do um, at Loft and, and how that might be relevant for you guys. So just a quick overview of today's presentation. I'll go over some industry background uh, to motivate kind of this presentation and, and why Loft exists and uh, go in more into Loft Orbital's approach. So the new, biz new business model um, for space missions that we offer, as well as some of the technical challenges that come along with that and the tools and capabilities that we've developed to address those challenges. Um, we'll also look at some of the current missions that LOFT's working on, uh, as well as mention of future applications uh, before closing, and of course, questions that I'll be happy to, to take. All right, um, diving right in. So traditional options for small satellite missions. Hopefully for my audience today, you guys are somewhat familiar uh, probably quite familiar with these options. Um, so CubeSats, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, are these really amazing um, small satellites that embrace standardization and really revolutionized the space industry in the early 2000s when they brought um, really cheap and fast alternatives to kind of the traditional spacecraft. Um, however, the drawbacks of CubeSats include the fact that they are limited by their size. Being small, uh, they're not able to accommodate large instruments or different payloads on board, because uh, at the end of the day, they have to fit within uh, CubeSat form factor for their deployer. And this can really limit the mission performance, so the actual technologies that you can have to support any mission on a CubeSat platform, and it can also actually limit what missions can be performed on it. And so an alternative to CubeSats, the very traditional um, way would be a custom spacecraft, something built specifically for its application for its mission in orbit. So it's uh, very optimized, it will have high performance, everything's derived from exactly what the mission and payload require. And they're often highly reliable, right? These are uh, built by teams of engineers, uh, take a very, very long time uh, to develop because everything's being again, optimized, all that non-recurrent engineering to really meet the specific needs of any given mission. And the drawbacks of that, of course, are the extended time that it takes. These can be year-long, decade-long projects. Um, and with that comes significant cost for the non-recurrent engineering and efforts for that. And kind of what Loft found was that not all customers are willing to make this trade-off, to have to find a compromise between um, these benefits and drawbacks. So you can imagine yourselves as perhaps you are even an instrument developer um, who's got a new technology that you want to demonstrate or operate in space. And both of these options are, are not quite right for you. You're looking for something, something else, maybe something in the middle. And so that's uh, where this idea for Loft came in. And at the core of it is decoupling the satellite bus from the payloads. So it was this idea that you could take a standard microsatellite bus, so more like those customized ones, um, but make them more standard, ones maybe you'd see in constellations that are being developed. So those microsatellite buses, the thought was, could you create a universal adapter or an interface that would allow you to isolate, decouple the customer payload from the st standard microsatellite bus? And that's exactly um, what Loft did, what Loft is doing. So Loft's technical approach um, is optimizing the pathway to orbit for speed and cost while still preserving the heritage of those standard microsatellite buses. Uh, so as you can see on this slide on the right, we've got uh, an example of a Loft mission. So at the bottom, you've got our standard, a standard satellite bus. This is from LOFS partners. We leverage the existing supply chains that exist in the space industry. Um, again, talking about those series production lines, different satellite buses being developed um, for Constellation or other applications. And so LOFS will essentially grab a few of those standard microsatellite buses 
And using this modular interface, uh, the Loft Payload Hub, you can remove all the non-recurrent engineering required um, to actually serve any sort of customer mission from that original standard bus, regardless of its original application. Um, and so these high performance microsatellite buses, in addition to the loft orbital payload hub, creates an in-space environment that can be used for all kinds of different um, applications, be it like a single dedicated mission or multiple payloads. So I'll get more into that as well. An example of how that all comes together again. So as I said, you'll start with the customer payloads. So that'll be your instrument, uh, the scientists, or maybe a commercial entity. They wanna operate and run a business in space. Um, we wanna be able to take their customer payloads and use our modular payload hub Think of these like Lego building blocks that uh, all exist in kind of standard modular form that can be reassembled in slightly different ways um, to accommodate different customer payloads, but without significant non-recurrent engineering. Those customer payloads and the Loft Payload Hub will all come together to be integrated into um, an integrated hub, as you see here. And then again, taking that standard satellite bus, the payload hub gets qualified um, and mounted to the actual bus to create a full space vehicle, um, all without having to make changes to the subsystems that are in that bus. So ADCS, uh, electrical power system, everything can remain the exact same as it was for previous flights. It re retains its flight heritage, uh, but comes together to serve purposes that it was never originally built for. So this new technical approach facilitates a really unique business model because there's some really cool benefits that you get uh, from taking this approach, from really decoupling the satellite bus from what instruments and missions it can fly. So first, it's that you can fly any payload or instrument. So as I mentioned, maybe you have um, a satellite bus that's built originally for an imaging constellation. Well, that can be used to perform uh, different missions beyond just imaging. It can do internet of things, it can do different radio frequency demonstrations, any sort of earth observation, or even um, like sun observation, different types of things can all be accommodated. Uh, in addition to just the variety of different missions that can be uh, accommodated, you can actually fit multiple payloads on any one of these high performance buses. So you can imagine, kind of shown here for scale, uh, the satellite bus is considerably larger than a CubeSat. So if you had several CubeSat class of instruments, um, so a couple units in size, right? Maybe 20, 30 centimeters um, long, you can actually put multiple um, of those instruments on one of these satellite buses because they can share the resources. These high power, high performance systems can accommodate several just different instruments all at once. And for all of those instruments on the bus, uh, they get to abstract away what's actually happening beyond their payload. Our customers get to focus on their core technology. We really believe that if you're a new instrument scientist, your role should not be uh, required that you're focusing all your energy on fitting a form factor, trying to get your design down um, to something that doesn't even meet maybe your original performance requirements. We want you to be able to focus on that core technology and use our uh, interface, our payload hub, to, to be able to abstract everything away and, and just let the, the bus perform its mission with you on board. And finally, what this actually brings together as our business model is that we deliver this mission to orbit all as a service. Um, so it's an space infrastructure as a service or space mission as a service, um, as we call it. And it's really an end-to-end -end solution uh, for accommodating and operating different customer payloads on orbit. The idea again for our customers, if you're focusing on your technology, we want you to be able to develop and test everything in your lab, uh, focusing on your technology and then hand off your payload. And essentially uh, we handle the rest from there up until launch and you start getting your payload data back um, to actually accomplish the goals that you had. And just to try to capture a little bit more what that end-to-end -end mission service is, 
uh, you can see here, it's, it's a lot. Uh, we start everything off from the mission designs and con ops definitions. So getting a really clear picture of what our customers goals are and, and defining what a successful mission looks like to them. Um, we also provide an EGSC, that's an electrical ground support equipment, uh, basically replaces a flat sat so that our customers can develop um, and test their instrument in the lab with an equivalent interface to what they'll see on the satellite bus. So they can really perform those end-to-end -end, um, testing for the test like you fly philosophy. Uh, and then once the customer ships the payload to loft orbital facilities, we'll have a payload to hub integration and test where basically all the payloads are assembled together in the hub um, and full functional tests and test campaigns are conducted. And then again, once the hub is integrated to the actual satellite bus, it goes through another round of testing. Um, and then after launch, our launches uh, are, after launch, the customers actually get to use a cockpit mission control service, which was developed by Loft, um, to control their missions. They get to task their instrument on orbit and operate the mission as if it was uh, completely their own, regardless of if this was um, rideshare or a dedicated mission. Uh, because that's all defined. We've already set up with the customer what their expectations are, how they're going to be operating that, and we ensure that all customers on board can complete their missions. Um, part of our end-to-end -end mission service also includes the ground segment. So again, as a scientist, you're not worrying about what ground facilities, having to set up any antennas or collect data from your spacecraft, from your payload. That's all handled through loft, uh, and this can all be end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, for, to meet customers' needs. And so that really comprehensive end-to-end -end service uh, requires a lot of loft. Basically, us making space simple for our customers means that we have to develop a lot of technologies internally or use um, highly capable technologies internally to, to make those missions successful to get them on orbit. So these are a few of the key enabling technologies that we use. Um, the first ones here you can see are power and data interfacing, mechanical, thermal, and onboard processing and mission enhancements are all part of that payload hub um, that we talked about. So that's for power and data interfacing, a modular flight hardware you can kind of see here like a little onboard computer that interfaces directly to any of the instruments on a loft mission and acts as a universal translator. So basically whatever um, communication protocols or different systems are used on the satellite bus. They don't have to match up one-to-one -one with the uh, customer payloads. We can kind of be the middleman that translates um, between the two. And again, that really helps with modularity and helping us work quickly and um, not enforce any changes on our customers that fly. The mechanical and thermal interface as well is built modularly so that the different panels, um, they're aluminum panels with aluminum honeycomb with embedded heat pipes. So they provide a really great uh, neutralized mechanical and thermal environment. So there's no um, thermal impacts on the payloads from the satellite bus that's actually completely um, isolated. And that modular design means that it can accommodate all different shapes and sizes of payloads. There's no strict form factor like you'd see on a CubeSat, right? These can be all different kinds of shapes and sizes and we configure these panels in different ways um, to mount and, and control the environment for them. Uh, as well as the actual mechanical and power, um, we have onboard processing and other enhancing uh, capabilities in our payload hub to make these missions um, more capable for our customers. So this includes like edge computing environments um, and just different software hosting. Uh, as well as things like an inner satellite relay link if there's a need to get down data with a really short latency um, to bring back data right after it's acquired. And so that's um, a little bit of a, an inside view of the payload hub, but actually most of, of my job personally at Loft um, takes place kind of in the uh, mission design and simulation tools, the before everything's assembled. Um, so as you can imagine, if you have several different payloads all sharing a bus, um, all having different missions, different requirements. We have a big undertaking at Loft to make sure that none of those 
uh, missions interfere with each other and that they complement each other, that the resources can be shared amongst the different instruments. Um, and so we have a lot of tools internally that we use to really um, address and track all of those requirements from our customers and ensure that we can meet all of their needs on orbit. And then actually delivering that um, is where our cockpit mission control service comes in. So this is a cloud-based tool that can allow for automated mission tasking. You can imagine you have a customer that wants to take pictures over the United States um, every day. Then you can set automated tasking in cockpit to allow that to happen um, regularly every time an opportunity comes up. Or they can also have specific tasking where maybe they say, we are interested in other areas. Sometimes I want to take a picture of England. Uh, and so they have the ability to go into cockpit and queue up basically the different tasks that they want to perform. And that's uh, designed for multiple users, multi-missions, because again, you think of a whole bunch of different payloads on there, you all have somebody tasking and operating um, their payload. And so cockpit was designed to be able to control all of that Okay, so that's been a lot of information about, um, yeah, kind of the behind the scenes, what's going on, our, our capabilities uh, internally, but now we get to talk about some fun actual missions, get to see some flight hardware. Uh, so this example is our YAM2 mission. Uh, YAM is our loft orbital uh, mission designation that stands for yet another mission. Um, and so YAM2 currently actually being tested, being prepared for launch in, uh, in spring of this year is, is shown here through a couple different stages of its integration. So on the left, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but this is the payload hub um, integration separate from the satellite bus. So you can take a look at the, the hub. Some of the walls have, are uh, removed in this picture so you can see what's internal. And what you're actually looking at here is a hyperspectral imager as well as some electronics and there's some other payloads hiding um, in there. And the YAM2 mission is a rideshare mission. So you can see there's uh, payloads from a variety of different customers that are there. And the, these are really cool missions because they're um, very, there's such a variety of instruments on board and customers that are filling that are providing those payloads that are filling these missions. Um, so as you can see here, like our examples are from the UAE Space Agency to UTELSAT and, and FUGRO. And so really our, our customer base ranges from these government agencies um, all the way to like startups that are maybe down the street from us in San Francisco that aren't traditionally um, space folks, but uh, they have a technology that they need in space and we can accommodate a whole bunch of different ones all together on one mission, which is really fun. Um, but yeah, so essentially the payload hub, looking into all those different instruments, they all get assembled together, end up looking like this MLI wrapped cube in, in this case, our hub, and then that actually gets integrated onto the space vehicle itself. Um, as I mentioned, LOF doesn't build these satellite buses, we're leveraging what exists in industry today. So in this example, this is a Blue Canyon Technologies, a BCT micro satellite bus. Um, some other examples of current missions, we've got YAM3, uh, which is this one on the left, which has got, again, a rideshare mission with several different payloads, um, an interesting autonomy and tactical ISR demo um, for DARPA as part of the Blackjack program. There's also a couple uh, Internet of Things, UTELSAT and TOTEM communications. Uh, and the applications are, are really endless. I mean, other customers, we've got them, them doing technology demonstrations, everything to blockchain in space. Um, if you can put it on a satellite and have an application, then we can, uh, we can host that on our platform. And again, just showing here some of the different, unfortunately uh, for privacy bl blurred out some of our customer payloads here, um, but different capabilities all hosted within the payload hub and on that standard satellite bus. And then personally, uh, probably my favorite mission as a Canadian and uh, a background in physics uh, is the Canadian Space Agency's KeySat mission, which is their quantum key distribution um, demonstration that LOFT uh, is delivering for the Canadian Space Agency and Honeywell, who's building their instruments and payload. 
So that's a really fun mission. It's dedicated in this case. So they're the sole customer um, that's flying on that satellite bus. But actually this spacecraft on the bottom you can see here is identical to the one on GAM2. So it's the exact same Blue Canyon technology bus. Um, in this case, doing hyperspectral imagery and IoT. Uh, and then for YAM4 is, is doing quantum key distribution. So that really fascinating idea that same underlying platform, completely different missions. And so just um, some different missions or just look, taking a look to the future of what's up next. Uh, LOF's goal is to have a, a regular cadence of missions. So we're providing multiple and regular access to space with uh, several different opportunities for single payloads, um, building out constellations, or again, dedicated missions if you want. Um, and these are moving on really fast timelines, which is exciting and fun. Uh, if it's a new dedicated mission or when payloads are um, ready for, or space qualified ready for orbit, basically, we can move as quickly as kickoff to four to six months um, before launch. So very exciting. Um, yeah, and these are some examples of our missions. So we've got YAM2 and YAM3 launching this year, um, as well as some upcoming missions in 2022, including that CUSAT mission for the Canadian Space Agency. And lots of different applications. I think probably my favorite um, is the idea of, of constellations as well, right? That you could have a constellation of satellites operating together in orbit, but they're all heterogeneous. They don't have to be the exact same every time. You could have the same payload, but the underlying platform um, is abstracted. So it, it doesn't matter what spacecraft exactly you're flying on. And so just to summarize, I guess, um, LOF's goal is offering missions as a service to provide an alternative pathway to space, really reducing the barrier to entry uh, while still delivering on reliability and performance. And I just have some contact information here for people that want to check out Loft or want to contact me directly. Um, but yeah, I guess this is a good place to stop and ask some questions if people have them. Yeah, thank you very much, MG. Um, yeah, certainly anybody, uh, uh, it's a good, good time for, for questions. I, I have one, but I'll, I'll save it in case there's others here. Okay. Hi, MG, this is Philip. Uh, can I ask two questions? Of course. Hi, Philip. <laughs> Hi, the, the first question I have is when you mentioned you have a, a constellation service, uh, are you also capable to uh, align onboard maneuvering between different satellites within the constellation or they're passively Ooh. controlled? Uh, so that would be like if you're in some position, you want to actually maybe change your position in orbit or conduct some maneuver that's not just pointing. It would actually be like a propulsion. Is that right? Yeah, there's proportion to control the relative geometry between different satellites within the constellation. Are you oh, I something see. in your roadmap? Yes, yeah, that well, controlling the geometry between the satellites, yes. Uh, certainly that's something that we're looking into with our current plans for, um, for constellations uh, for different customers. The key there would be, of course, finding, if they're going to be rideshare missions, uh, finding customers that all want to be in um, the same orbits and maintaining the same uh, configurations, right? But in theory, if you had, yeah, a group of uh, a couple different instruments that all want to be in, say, like a Walker Delta formation and they want to maintain that uh, throughout their operational lifetime, then yeah, we would equip basically the satellite with a propulsion system and everybody would be able to meet their operational needs. Yeah, thanks. And the second question I have is, how do you provide a precise orbit determination for your clients? Let's say I give you a payload you launch into the bay. Uh, can I know the exact position of orbit in a given interval time within a level of, let's say, meter level? Uh, I, I, I know you mentioned you have like ground monitoring station. Is that global coverage uh, able to track all the satellite? you know, 24 seven, or you have to do some kind of, you know, poly interpolation to provide the orbital information? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. So certainly we do use, um, say like TLEs or, or different orbit propagation methods to be tracking and, and monitoring. Uh, but we also have um, a mission enhancing capability 
uh, on our satellites to provide really accurate um, within the order, I believe, of 10 meters uh, of position in space um, through some, I believe it's a relay uh, where we can be positioned relative to other uh, geosynchronous satellites and, and have that fed back to the ground so that customers have, yes, a surprisingly precise um, idea of where the satellite is in any given orbit. And that's all conducted through cockpit. So I'm not sure if it's visible in any of my slides a little bit here, but essentially the dashboard that our customers get to see on um, cockpit on mission control looks a little bit like this. I'm not sure if it's too small on the screen, um, but you do get like a, an orbital ground track map um, as well as information, general telemetry about the satellite, uh, including its position. Thanks. So when you mentioned you use the geo satellite for inter-satellite link for tracking and orbit determination, are those the, your business partner or are those actually the satellite utilized to do radio navigation? Could you clarify more about that? Sure, this isn't um, exactly my, <laughs> uh, my precise area of expertise. So uh, I'm hoping this information is correct for you. Um, but yes, this is, these are certainly loft orbital partners. So that's part of like the mission enhancement uh, that we would provide. So that capability would be something that's not built into the satellite bus originally, um, but something that we include in our payload hub uh, that's offered by a partner. So a technology with, I believe it's a receiver um, on our end that then communicates with another positioning system to provide that really accurate positioning. Sorry, I hope that answered yeah. your question. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Philip. <laughs> yeah, anybody else uh, with any, any particular questions? Well, I'll just ask real quick, you know, the, the project we're working on is sort of a technology demonstration. Um, something that's really attractive to us is we can develop an instrument and then you can help us fly it. And I, I hope NASA goes in a direction of doing that kind of thing a lot more. But but do you see that as a good direction? And uh, would there be more than just say NASA interest in that kind of thing? Oh, I yeah, I certainly I certainly think so and hope so. I, I think that's, um, as I mentioned, like what we see is one of our core values here, right, is the idea that you can uh, demonstrate, do any sort of mission because you're not requiring the instrument developer uh, to have to construct basically the whole mission and manage everything. They can really focus on their instrument and essentially hand those off uh, to loft and we can deliver them to orbit for you and see, demonstrate <clears throat> the technology that you want. So uh, yeah, I believe NASA is getting more interested in this and I, I see lots of applications beyond that. I'd, I'd love to see um, similar types of things come up in education and academia, right? That have people develop um, payloads in the classroom or in the lab and uh, have those tested on a platform that, you know, is launching every quarter, several launches a year. Just it's ready for you. You build to our, our payload hub interface and then plop it on a satellite. Yeah, I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> that sounds good. You know, I mean, that, that's music to our ears. I just, you know, where I come from is worried we're high maintenance because we don't just want to point in one direction necessarily all the time. We want to point all over the place, you know, depending on what, what science we're doing. And that, that must make us hard to pair up with other, uh, other payloads. That is true. That is where, yeah, definitely the mission design tools come into play. And we want to make sure that we can accomplish uh, everybody's mission. But it, it is fascinating, like seeing, you can imagine you have, uh, in your case, right, as you mentioned, um, different pointing requirements and different needs, but perhaps your instrument doesn't need to be on every day. It takes complete control um, for every orbit for a day and then it's off for a week. And uh, as you can imagine, kind of those very different types of demonstration needs in particular uh, can actually be complementary when you, when you have a bunch of them together that are um, kind of similar in that case. Yeah, that certainly makes it workable for us. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask a question and certainly um, I can understand if it's it's too much down in the, in the weeds, maybe I'll start at a, a higher level. Uh, but I think you had uh, 
something that started, you know, or was talked to um, kind of the, the ground segment or more of um, the, the kind of data communications part of that? Can you kind of elaborate some more on, uh, on that about like how is that kind of more standard, you know, with your standard setup uh, with how your, your downlink happens or is that kind of more mission specific, I guess, depending on the needs? Cool. Sorry, I just had some technical That's okay. <laughs> uh, difficulties there that jumped yeah, around. Yeah, you need to repeat. Uh, so yeah. it was the ground segment trying to understand the downlinking opportunities, or well, yeah, I, mean, I guess it's it not necessarily. So I know there's like the 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 EGSE, uh, which is that's a really neat feature, um, but more more so, yeah, like when the satellite's up, like how do you get the you know data down? Is that more of a standard or kind of options or kind of more? Kind of elaborate on that, I guess. Sure. Yeah. No, that that is a great question because, as I mentioned in our um, ride share configurations, basically all of the instruments on board get to share the resources, uh, and so a large part of that is the um, data that you're collecting and, and downlinking it. What is the link budget, um, and what portion of that can be accommodated or, or delivered to each instrument? Um, so for our ground segment, we partner uh, with different ground segment providers, currently KSAT, um, which has a great global network of different ground stations. And with an X-band uh, transceiver on board, we can uh, downlink all of our payload data at a relatively high uh, rate. So meaning, especially for say the hyperspectral imagers that we've got on board, uh, we're still able to get all of that data down and latency is really a function of what the customer uh, is willing to pay and what they need. So if you need um, really next to instantaneous latency, we can look into adding different um, basically nodes of the KSAT ground station network uh, and using those to downlink your data perhaps right after uh, image acquisition or something has occurred. Um, so our standard operations, I think we'll use the, the polar ground stations through the KSAT network. So you're getting uh, downlink opportunities from an SSO orbit um, once or twice in orbit at minimum. And that provides us with several gigabytes of, of downlink um, just in payload data uh, per pass. So uh, enough so far that that's been able to meet all of our, our customer needs with um, maybe more infrequent ground station passes, but as I said, that can kind of be scaled really nicely, just depending on what um, the instrument requires. That's that's great. Uh, yeah, that, that answers it perfectly. Um, and, and I guess it, to to follow on with that, because I know uh, maybe a, a, a faculty or two might have a question to this, because it's uh, a topic or a, a problem in the past uh, here at Virginia Tech, is do you then handle um, or have to go through like the FCC licensing for that? Or is that something that more KSAT uh, handles or? Ooh, you know, yeah. <laughs> is that a good one? That's a good, <laughs> it's, and if it's too much, you know, kind of outside, I can certainly understand, but that was something that, you know, we were talking about and in, in handling the kind of licensing part, you know, is that something that, that Loft Orbital, you know, kind of takes takes charge of or? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if my screen is still sharing. If yeah. it, um, so then that actually you got, got it right on the right slide. We do have regulatory licensing and insurance <laughs> included as part of our our end to end solution. Um, the specifics of it, I, I would want to circle up with our licensing guy to get his actual description of, of how that works and how that uh, maybe can be specific to what you're doing um, on board with your instrument. Uh, certainly depending on, yeah, like the radio frequency licensing or different um, image acquisition that you might do. Uh, but yeah, that's part of our, our offering. We work with our customers and make sure everything's <laughs> licensed that's on board. Yep, yeah, it's, it was, you know, not didn't need a like detailed answer, but yeah, that's, that's certainly, I think it was just more of, is that something that Loft is, is does, so thank you. Yeah, do have some expertise there internally. We can, yeah, use. How long is the typical lifespan for your um, satellites? Is there like something where if you need a longer lifetime, you can launch to higher altitude or? Ooh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Kind of brings up a couple different things. Um, so 
one of the benefits to using like a larger microsatellite platform um, rather than perhaps the CubeSat is that design lifetime. So our buses um, that, we're that we're using currently um, from Blue Canyon Technologies and Leo Stella are, are built for the three to five year um, operational lifespan on orbit. So they're qualified to be able to, or all of their subsystems in the bus are qualified to be able to uh, meet those longer operational objectives. The actual length of operation for any given payload on the satellite, like say if they only needed to do a demonstration for a shorter period of time, um, or they're really looking to maximize the five years, that, that's defined with each of our customers individually. Um, but then in terms of the actual orbit that they're um, launched to, currently we're using uh, SpaceX rideshare launches. So these are all so far to sun synchronous orbit, roughly like a 550 kilometer um, to maybe 600, between 400 and 600, normally around 550 kilometer range. But that is dependent on where customers want to go. Um, so if there's a demand to go to specific different orbits, then it's a matter of procuring a launch um, that meets yeah, that actual deployment target, which again, as part of LOF's offering where we do handle all of the, the launch part of that, that's something that we discuss with the customer and basically make sure you're manifested onto a mission that's going to the right place for you. Cool, thank you. Uh, any other questions from uh, anybody here for, for MG? Um, if not, then thank you very much, uh, MG, and, and certainly uh, great to have a uh, you know, perspective from outside of the outside of the university. Yeah, thank you. I guess actually I will say on our closing note as well, because I did include it here um, for any students looking for potential career opportunities. Um, if you're coming up on graduation or looking even for uh, internships, I know LOF does have some current openings and we have an open application spot uh, where we do take in interns for like a full year. Uh, and oftentimes those can lead to jobs uh, at the company. So I just, yeah, I want to point out, you know, the student audience, if there's any of you uh, that you think this might sound interesting, want to join our team, then please check that out or feel free to reach out to me directly. Thanks. A remotely build a satellite, given the remote work from home configuration now. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed the beginning of that. <laughs> I mean, the position, I, I, is it remotely? Are, are you working at mm. home with your, your colleague right now? <laughs> yes, yeah, so currently I am at home. Um, Loft actually has uh, three offices, one in San Francisco, that's where I am, um, not at the office, but uh, our headquarters is in San Francisco, but we have um, a facility in Colorado and actually a subsidiary, subsidiary in France. Um, so we're, a little bit spread out and also spread out between the office and from home. So uh, as we're currently integrating two missions, our YAM uh, 2 and YAM 3, there's certainly some people in person working on hardware, uh, but then we have remote working as well from home. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to uh, assemble a spacecraft remotely. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. To get a good, good team of robots, but... Uh, <laughs> not easy for, for smaller companies and or even some of the larger companies, right? So not unless you're yeah. assembling on, you know, a, a car manufacturer or something. But, um, anyways, well, thank you very much. And, and certainly, yeah, it's, it was good to uh, kind of bring that in. Uh, hopefully some of our, our students can check you guys out. So uh, with that, yeah, we'll, we'll close here. And uh, thanks everybody. Again, we'll have another uh, seminar uh, coming up in uh, two weeks, so. Have a good evening or have a good day.